And so, Lord, I thank you for your word uh, through wills. And so um, you're asking me, you're asking us, can I hold you now? So, Lord, it, we, it's a weird thing to talk to you. But I think with what we have, I say, we say, yes. And God, that wasn't a yes that I think we just thought up. That was a yes that you thought up from before the foundation of the world and is in fact holiness now. That's some crazy stuff, God. So would you please help us to preach? Amen. Hello, Pooh. I'm Tigger. I know. You've bounced me before. One had to be careful when Tigger was in a bouncy mood, as he could be quite surprising. Oh, no. Stop! Oh, God! Hello, Rabbit. I'm Tigger. Rabbit, having had quite enough of Tigger's bouncing, decided to hold a meeting to determine what could be done to put an end to it. I'll bet you could climb trees, huh, Tigger? <laughs> climb trees? <laughs> That's what Tigger's do best. Only Tiggers don't climb trees, they bounce them. Come on, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I almost bounced clear out of the book. <laughs> Say, how did this tree get so high? Hey, 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 what's happening now? Don't swing on a string. It's much too frail. The best kind of swing is a Tigger's tail. What's the matter, Tigger? I was just getting seasick from seeing too much. And it wasn't long before Christopher Robin and the others learned of Tigger's precarious predicament. <gasps> Hello, Pooh. What's up? Tigger and Roo are up. Come on, everyone. Let's hold the corner of my coat. You're first, Roo. Jump. Try not to fall too fast, dear. Whee! Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> Gee, that was fun. You're next, Tigger. <gasps> jump. <laughs> Tiggers don't jump. They bounce. You can climb down, Tigger. Uh, but Tiggers can't climb down uh, 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 because uh, their tails get in the way. Well, Tigger, it seems the spring in your tail has bounced you into a bit of trouble. Say, who are you? I'm the narrator. Well, then please, for goodness sakes, narrate me down from here. Very well. Now. Let's stop at now. <laughs> I used to watch this like all the time with my son, John. Um, and actually these are online now on YouTube. Uh, the, the mini adventures, M-I-N-I, of Winnie the Pooh. So you can Google this and you can watch this, especially these two episodes, What Tiggers Do Best and Unbouncing Tigger. I, I really like this episode and I especially like Tigger because I can identify with uh, Tigger. Tigger gets in trouble with his bouncing. He bounces when other people don't want him to bounce. And his addiction gets so bad that he bounces himself right out of his own story and into a tree. And that raises some profound questions. Like, number one, are we characters in a book that's already been written? Psalm 139, 16. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. Number two, if your life is a story being told by someone else, is it possible to bounce yourself right out of your own story? That is, the book. Exodus 32, verse 33. Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. And number three, if there is a narrator, you know, like a word spoken by the author, could he narrate us 
back into the author's book. The book of life, you could call it. And what would happen if we argued with the narrator? And how could a character in a story argue with the narrator of the story of which he is being narrated? But if we could not argue with the narrator of the story, wouldn't we just be objects in the story? Objects and not subjects. In other words, things and not persons. Unconscious rather than conscious, and therefore incapable of even thinking these thoughts or asking these questions that we're asking right now. You know, I think we have such a hard time with the Bible because we don't believe the Bible particularly the first three chapters of the Bible. In the first three chapters of the Bible, all of these questions are addressed. In Genesis chapter 1, God the author creates all things through a narrator. He creates all things with his word, beginning to end, and on the seventh day, everything is good and it is finished. But we don't believe that. We don't believe that this has happened, will happen, or could happen, and yet Genesis 1 states it as just a fact. And the rest of the Bible makes a huge deal out of this fact with weekly reminders that it is so. We've talked about that quite a bit. In Genesis chapter 2, not all is created, and not everything is good, and so it's no longer the seventh day. It is now the sixth day in Genesis chapter 2, because God is making Adam in his image. Now, people say that can't be true, because God has already made all things in chapter 1, but we forget that God is the author. He's the author of space and time themselves, and he reminds us, look, for me, a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. So on day six, he creates Adam, that is humanity, And we are humanity. We are characters in a story that's already been written. And yet, in Genesis 2, it's being written. For on the seventh day, everything is good and it is finished. But in Genesis chapter 2, Adam is not good. It's not good for the Adam to be alone, says the narrator. And then, in Genesis 3, something truly mind-bending happens. Adam, which is us, bounces himself out of the book and right up into this tree and starts arguing with the narrator, which creates the tension in the rest of the story. Can the narrator narrate us down from here and write us back into the book? Does the narrator want to narrate us down from here and back into his book? Who are we? to argue, let alone speak with a narrator of the story or even the author of the book himself. And now you see, that's not just a biblical question, is it? That's the human question that haunts every decision that's ever been made by anyone anywhere. Do I have free will? And what the heck would that mean? Do I have free will? Some say no, which implies that we're just objects. That is, characters in another person's stories. Objects. But objects don't ponder these questions or bounce themselves out of a story, even if it's about them. Do we have free will? Some say yes, which means we're each subjects, like the subject of a sentence, we're each subject, the actors, which means the ones doing the action, which means that each of us is writing our own individual story, which means there really is no author of our story. And everything is just the roll of the dice, so to speak. Are we characters in a story or just a cosmic accident like the roll of the dice? You see, that's a question that haunts every human heart. And in the Bible, it may be most beautifully addressed in the book of Esther. Last week, we preached a sermon titled Wisdom and Two Harlots, which was about uh, the wisdom of Solomon judging two harlots in one house. Remember? The one house is one woman 
who is a harlot bride and a mother, all because of the judgment of wisdom. And it made me think of Esther. Esther, now listen, Esther may be the weirdest book in the entire Bible. And so many people have thought that it shouldn't be in the Bible, or it should at least be changed a bit before it gets admitted to the Bible. Apparently, it was written in Persia several hundred years before Christ. It was written about events that would have happened about a hundred years after the Jews had been taken into exile, taken to Babylon in 597 B.C. In 539 B.C., Cyrus, the king of Persia, conquered Babylon and allowed the Jews to return to Jerusalem, but some Jews remained in Persia, okay, in the capital city of Susa. So this is probably around 500 B.C. or something. The book of Esther is about some of those Jews in Susa in Persia under the reign of Ahavarush. That's her. We know him as Xerxes. And then this is what's weird. This is what's weird. God is not even mentioned in the book of Esther. All of the characters in the book of Esther are morally ambiguous. Clearly, the Jews in the book do not fulfill the law, and sometimes the pagans, like Queen Vashti, do. So it's not a morality tale, which really bugs religious folks. When Esther was translated into Greek and added to the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, someone added all sorts of narrative and prayer to make the characters more acceptable to religious folks and deserving of God's favor, and those additions can now be found in the Apocrypha. It's called the additions to Esther. And if you ever watched the recent movie, One Night with the King, you seriously need to consider this movie to be apocrypha as well. I recently watched it with my wife, who has a serious, I've been praying for her, she has a serious addiction to the Hallmark Channel. And even she thought that this was unbelievable and sappy. We have a serious problem with grace. And so we have a way of turning the most amazing Bible stories into these sappy morality plays. The book of Esther is like a fairy tale soap opera, but definitely not one that's written for children. This is how Xerxes was portrayed in the movie 300, which is probably more accurate than his portrayal in One Night with the King. In chapter one of Esther, in the third year of his reign, Xerxes throws a party for 187 days. The last seven days of, of the feast, there are no rules. That's the one rule, that there are no rules, mate. You could even wear a golden Speedo if, if you wanted to, okay? So this is Esther chapter 1, verse 10. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he was drunk, he commanded his servants, a bunch of eunuchs, to bring Queen Vashti before the king with her royal crown in order to show the peoples and the princes her beauty, for she was lovely to look at. And Queen Vashti refuses to come. In one night with the king, they have Vashti refused because she disagrees with the king's politics. According to the old rabbis, it was because with her royal crown really meant with only her royal crown, which makes a lot more sense to, to the story. Whatever the case, the king objectifies his queen, and the queen refuses to be objectified. And for that, she prays a heavy price. When she refuses the king, the king flies into a rage. He orders Queen Vashti to never appear before him again. Uh, he issues a decree that all the women of the land must obey their husbands and their husbands must make them obey and orders officers to round up all the beautiful young virgins in the empire and put them in his harem so that he can test them and find the one that would please him most so that she can replace Vashti. It's then, chapter 2, that we meet a Jewish orphan with a Jewish name Hadassah that goes by the Persian name Esther, which either means star or Ishtar, the pagan goddess Ishtar, or maybe, maybe both. Esther is being raised by her uncle Mordecai, who apparently has some sort of access to the king's court, because maybe he's like a, a clerk or a scribe. When the Persian officers come for Esther, Mordecai commands Esther not to reveal her Jewish identity, which clearly means do not obey the dietary laws and um, the ethical commands about marriage, Esther, but you keep your identity a secret. At this point, all we really know about Esther 
other than the fact that she's an orphan, is this, Esther chapter 2, verse 7. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. In verse 12, we read how each virgin, take, virgin taken was beautified for six months with oil of myrrh and then six months with spices. Each one was basted like a chicken for an entire year. The ancient historian Josephus guesses there were 400 young women, but if the king had one girl each night for four years, which the text seemed to indicate, there would have been 1,460 virgins taken by Xerxes, the man in the golden speedo. In the movie One Night with the King, when Esther spends her night with the king, there is no immorality. In fact, Esther tells Bible stories to Xerxes, who's so impressed he asks her to marry him. I mean, that's realistic, right? But you see, that's not the picture that the Bible's painting. The Bible is portraying a reality far too familiar to far too many women. A man in power is raping one girl after another girl, destroying her hopes of ever experiencing communion in a covenant of unlimited grace called marriage, which produces life like beloved children. This is the point. Esther is being objectified. So just because the king picks her, it does not mean that she's won. She's been picked by an evil husband. Can you imagine? I mean, she must have been constantly forced to break the commandments, which she and her childhood had been told were strictly required by the Lord Yahweh. Some Jews have been willing to die over such things. You remember like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel, refusing to sin. But who could blame Esther? Because she's a victim, right? Don't expect too much from Esther. She's probably 15 or 16 years old, hiding her identity incredibly alone, even when celebrated as the playmate of the year. According to God on Mount Sinai, Deuteronomy 32, 33, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. So how does she feel? Forsaken, ashamed, incredibly alone, exiled from her own people. And, and yet Mordecai secretly meets her by a gate, and, and one day he reveals a plot against the king, and as Esther tell the king, which foils the plot and has Mordecai's name recorded in the royal records. In chapter 3 of Esther, Xerxes promotes a man named Haman the Agagite, which probably refers to King Agag of the Amalekites, the ancient enemies of, of, the, of the Jews. He, he puts him in command of the entire empire, second in command. But because Mordecai won't bow down to Haman the Agagite, and because Haman the Agagite hates the Jews, Haman plots a genocide against all the Jews. In order to decide the best timing for the genocide, he does what a lot of the ancients did at that time. He rolls the dice, literally. He casts poor, or parim is the plural, that is lots, which implies that the fate of the Jews is the roll of a dice. And so there is no author to their story, or at least not one author, maybe a host of spirits and demons and low-level pagans, but basically chance. In other words, chaos credited with creation. Imagine that. Once Haman determines the date, he convinces the king that the Jews are enemies of Persia and that killing them would line the royal coffers. And so the king gives Haman his signet ring and allows him to issue a decree. Chapter 4, Mordecai learns of the decree and through a eunuch named Hathach uh, that had been assigned to, to Esther, Mordecai sends a message to Esther commanding her to plead with the king on the behalf of her people, the Jews. Esther chapter 4, verse 10. Then Esther spoke to Hathach and commanded him to go to Mordecai. So Hathach is going back and forth. And say, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king these 30 days. 
She hadn't talked to her husband, who understandably was very busy with an entire harem full of concubines. She hadn't talked to her husband for 30 days. And she thinks that if she does, he's going to kill her. See, they don't have a great marriage. That's what that means. Verse 12. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think to yourself, do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether, if, or perhaps, who knows if, whether, perhaps, whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. He doesn't even say, this is so. He just poses a question, uh, uh, poses an idea in the form of a question. Um, perhaps life is not the role of the dice. Maybe someone is writing the story. Perhaps we're not just victims of chance, but characters in a story. Perhaps nothing in the past has happened by accident. And yet, such a time as this is not in the past or in the future. Perhaps all time exists for this moment now. Perhaps you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Think about that. Isn't Mordecai saying to Esther, perhaps the Jews were taken into captivity in Babylon in 597 BC. Cyrus, king of Persia, liberated them in 539. Our ancestors stayed in Susa, the capital of Persia. Your parents died and you were raised by me with this great looking body while Queen Vashti refused to be objectified so that you would be objectified, hide your identity, break all the dietary commands and basically assent to rape. Because, why, why, why? Because, because, because it was all determined by the author of the story. Why? for such a time as this, when you could make a choice, which would determine the outcome of everyone's story, including the author's story, or at least the narrator's story. I mean, do you see how outrageous this thought is, this idea? And yet, it's an idea that each one of us harbors in the depths of our soul at the edge of a curtain leading to the Holy of Holies. It's the thought you ponder every time you think, maybe this all just didn't happen by chance. Perhaps all of this happened for a reason. And now, I need to make a decision. A judgment. A good judgment. And what is the judgment that Esther, whom I would imagine has retreated into a bubble of self-pity, right? What is the judgment that Esther is being asked to make? She, of all people, is being asked to save God's people. <laughs> That's just crazy. Perhaps you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this, now, we have a phrase, or a word for the phrase such a time as this, right? And that word is now. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Paul writes this crazy thing. He writes, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, all things are of God. And then he appeals to the Corinthians to be reconciled to God, who's always reconciled himself to us. And, and then he, he quotes or us to whatever, it's confusing. And then he quotes Isaiah uh, in 6.2 saying this, For he says, in a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, look, pay attention, says Paul, now is the favorable time. Now is the day of salvation. And now is such a hard time to talk about. For the moment I say now, right, the now is already become the past. I mean, if, I, if I'm thinking, if I anticipate now, if this is the future, now is always in the future. But all of a sudden, now is, in, is immediately in the past. In fact, now is like an infinitely small po point in time, which isn't actually in time. 
but more like the moment eternity touches time or I touch eternity. It's the moment that I become conscious of my story and so observe me. But I cannot be me if I am observing me in time, which is where I am. The riddle of the present is the deepest of all the riddles of time, writes the theologian Paul Tillich. Not everybody and nobody all the time is aware of this eternal now in the temporal now, but sometimes it breaks in powerfully into our consciousness and gives us the certainty of the eternal, of a dimension of time which cuts into time and gives us our time. Now is the judgment of this world, said Jesus in John 12. Now the ruler of this world is cast out. In the screw tape letters, C.S. Lewis depicts the senior devil coaching a junior devil in how to tempt this guy. And the senior devil says this, the humans live in time, but our enemy, God, destines them to eternity. He therefore, I believe, wants them to attend chiefly to two things, to eternity itself and to that point of time which they call the present. For the present is the point at which time touches eternity. Of the present moment, and of it only, humans have an experience analogous to the experience which our enemy, God, has of reality as a whole. In it, the present moment, freedom and actuality are offered them. Our business, the business of evil, is to get them away from the eternal and from the present. In other words, now. Stuck in the past or worried about the future, I can't live now. Eternal life now. Jesus said, now is the judgment of this world. Now is the rule of this world cast out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. In the Revelation, one begins to realize that there's no place for the devil now. <laughs> For now is that point when and where eternity touches time. Well, enough philosophy of now for now. Back to our story. Okay, so if I lost you, back to our story. Mordecai says deliverance will rise for the Jews, but if you keep silent, you will perish. Which is utterly ironic because Esther is a Jew, right? And deliverance will rise for the Jews. Deliverance will rise for the Jews. And then he says, perhaps you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. If what Mordecai postulates is true, it means that Esther has been chosen to choose. But if what Mordecai postulates is not true, it means that Esther has not been chosen. And if Esther has not been chosen, she's not a character in a story, and in fact there's really nothing to choose. For everything is nothing but the roll of the dice, the casting of loss, that is chaos. And yet, if what Mordecai postulates is true, then Esther has been chosen to choose. But Esther did not choose to be chosen. If she thinks she chose to be chosen to choose, in other words, if she's proud of her choice or ashamed of her choice, if she thinks she chose to be chosen to choose, she clearly wasn't chosen to choose, and there's really nothing to be chosen. Everything is casting of the dice. But if Esther has been chosen to choose, then everything is a gift, including Esther's choice. It means that faith, hope, and love are a gift. And faithlessness, hopelessness, and lovelessness are not even a choice, but only bondage to the roll of the dice. In other words, chaos is not free will. It's no will. If Esther has been chosen to choose, it means that someone is writing the story and has written the story to this point, but now at this point, that someone is Esther. 
or that someone is in Esther, or that someone was in Esther all along and Esther just found out about it. (laughs) You see, Esther has been objectified, but just this idea in this moment has already subjectified Esther. I mean, personified Esther. It's even created Esther, the person, and not just the thing. So perhaps you have been chosen to choose. But what a weird choice. If you have been chosen to choose, do you now make the choice? Or is the choice making you? Sorry. I said enough philosophy, right? Back to the story. So if I lost you, back to the story. Mordecai suggests to Esther that she's not just an object, but maybe she is now the subject that determines the object or all objects. Maybe Esther's in control, like total control. And yet Esther must lose control to gain control. She must be willing to die. Or perhaps she just did die the moment she heard the word, the idea, the logos. In other words, Esther must lose her life to find it. 414, Mordecai says, if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish, and who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king. Then on the third day, the choice, deliverance, will rise within Esther. Then Esther makes a choice or the choice makes Esther. Maybe the choice is making Esther over the course of, I don't know, three days. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law, Persian law, and if I perish, I perish. If I die, I die. Well, of course you'll die, Esther. We're all going to die. The question is, will you die for your people and sacrifice your life? Or will you sacrifice your people in order to save your own little, lonely, miserable life for however long it takes the king and Haman to figure out that you're a Jew? Then I will go to the king though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. Do you get that? Esther is no longer just an object. She just told Mordecai what to do, and he's doing it. Chapter 5, on the third day, she stands in the inner court of Xerxes, but he doesn't kill her. And yet, she doesn't plead for the Jews. Instead, she invites the king and Haman to this great banquet. At the banquet, while drinking, the king asks her about her quest, and she invites him to another banquet the following day, along with Haman. And we wonder, Esther, are you going to make your choice? Haman loves the first banquet. Uh, He leaves happy, but as he's leaving, he sees Mordecai, who refuses to bow. So Haman commands his servants to build an eight. That's can be translated tree or gallows, 50 feet high on which to hang Mordecai. Meanwhile, the king, king cannot sleep for some reason, and he has his servants read the royal records. That'll put you to sleep. But through reading the royal records, he remembers that Mordecai, this guy, had once saved him from an attempt on his life. And so through this stunning reversal of fortune, the king commands Haman to honor Mordecai, the man he had just planned to hang on the tree. He plans to, he wants him to honor him by marching Mordecai through the capital on a horse or whatever in the king's robe, declaring this is the man the king chooses to honor. That night, the king and Haman then go to Esther's second banquet, second feast, and there she reveals that she's a Jew. And Mordecai, who once saved Xerxes, is also a Jew. And her uncle, who's like a father, and that the man plotting to kill them all is Haman. And then an even greater reversal unfolds in the remaining chapters of Esther. Haman gets hung on his own tree, his own gallows. Mordecai replaces Haman as second in command of the entire empire of Persia, and it's decreed that on the days that Haman's men were determined to kill the Jews, it is now determined that all the Jews can kill those that were determined to kill them, and they do. And then Esther and Mordecai declare that those very same dates are now to be celebrated by all the Jews throughout all the world for all of time. 
and they call this Purim. The Feast of Purim. Commemorating the fact that on the day that the enemy of the Jews rolled the dice, neither fate, chaos, nor demons were in control of the dice. And the someone who did control the dice saved the Jews through a formerly objectified sex slave named Esther. And that someone must have been the author of the whole story, narrating the whole thing with just a word. Just an idea. Planted in human flesh like a, a seed in a womb. Esther 9.22. These days had been turned for them from sorrow into gladness and from mourning into holiday. Literally in the Hebrew, good day. Notice that it doesn't say that gladness replaced sorrow. That's what we normally think. It says sorrow was turned into gladness. Sorrow had been turned into gladness, so thank God for the sorrow. And mourning had been turned into good day. That's the seventh day. That's the great reversal. That's the story arch in every story that's any story. <laughs> now, step back. Notice how this whole story has been designed. The story was full of moments of ironic reversal, but we can now see the whole story is structured as an ironic reversal, right down to the details. So the king's splendor and feasts and decrees are mirrored by Mordecai's splendor and feasts and decrees at the end. Esther and Mordecai, they first saved the king, but now in the end, they save all of the Jews. Then you have Haman's elevation and edicts and banquet that gets reversed by Mordecai's elevation and edict and banquet. And then at the center, you have Esther and Mordecai's planning scenes, and then Esther's two banquets that act as a frame around the greatest moment of reversal in the whole story, Haman's humiliation and Mordecai's exaltation. Beautiful. That's the Bible project, and I think they do a good job mapping out the whole story, but I think they miss the moment that the story pivots. The moment the story pivots is a hidden moment in the inner sanctuary of the temple that is a teenage concubine named Esther. It's the moment that Esther believes that she has chosen to choose, and so chooses to be what she always and forever is, the chosen. She didn't choose to make God choose her, but she did choose to be what she always was, the chosen. Chosen to choose. I think the great reversal is the great reversal of Esther. For she goes before she goes from being an objectified harlot, right? Written out of the book of her people, the Jews. She goes from that to a bride who surrenders in a moment to the wisdom of God, who is the judgment of God, who is the word of God, and the king of the Jews. To the mother of the Jews. Mother of the Jews because Esther saves the Jews. The Jews. She gives birth to the Jews, and Jesus is the king of the Jews. She's married to a new king now, the king of the Jews. She goes from harlot to bride to mother, for in a moment she entertained this idea that she might have been chosen to choose by the narrator of the author's story, or as we referred to him last week, wisdom. Last week we preached on the two harlots in one house that stood before the wisdom of Solomon, and we said that we each are like the two harlots in one house. We are each an old self and a new self in one body. It's like what we talked about for all of the book of Romans. And in a moment of crisis, you remember, the lying harlot is silenced in, in the judgment. She's silenced. The harlot becomes the bride and she gives birth to wisdom, revealing the mother that she always was but didn't know that she was. You see, your true self is born out of your false self in an eternal moment that is a decision, but it's not our decision. <laughs> Except that it's God's decision in us. 
It's the judgment of God in us. And born of us, birthed of us. When the lying harlot said, my baby, she meant the baby I made, right? And so the baby that is mine, the baby that is dead to me, an object, a thing. But when the honest harlot said, my baby, she didn't mean the baby that I made, uh, the baby I, 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 I made, but in fact the baby that made me a mother. She meant the baby I didn't make, but the baby that made me. My baby, not because I made the baby, but because the baby was born through me. A life through me. Likewise, when you say, my life, you might mean the life that I think I created. And if so, it will be dead to you. It isn't actually you. It's a false you. Or when you say, my life, you might mean the life I didn't create, but that creates me and is now born through me, the life of Jesus in me, the light in my darkness, the good in my bad, the life in this body of death, the Christ child in this empty womb. Likewise, when you say, my judgment, you might mean the judgment I think I made, in which case it will be evil and dead, and only an illusion, it will be a bad judgment. Or, when you say, my judgment, you might mean the judgment I didn't make, but the judgment that made me. The judgment that is born of me and my travail. The judgment of the narrator through me that is the new me, the new me of whom I'm no longer proud or ashamed, but just really grateful and enjoying all the time. See, you can bounce yourself out of your own story into a false story, a false self. But even the false self is part of God's story and the revelation of your true self. Likewise, when you say my story, you may mean the story I've written and it's all about me, and if so, it's, it's, it's only fiction. <laughs> it's bad fiction. Or when you say my story, you may mean the story that's been written through me, the story I gave birth to that's called reality. And then you're no longer taking from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you're being fed by the tree of life. Or maybe inseminated. People get stressed when you say that kind of stuff in church. But, but you see the harlot, the bride and the mother are like our past, present, and actual future. But it's only in the present moment when I am conscious of I am that I am that my bad decisions become his good decision. His good decision is his creation and my true self. Now, all of that is just a nightmare to explain, right? I tried, but it's hard. So, you could just read the story of Esther and dare to believe that you are just like Esther the bride of Christ, the king of creation, and the narrator. Or, 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 you could just watch the many adventures of Winnie the Pooh and Tigger too, and trust me when I say that you are just like Tigger. We left the story at the word now. Jump! <laughs> Tiggers don't jump, they bounce! You can climb down, Tigger! Uh, but tiggers can't climb down uh, 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 because uh, their tails get in the way. Well, Tigger, it seems the spring in your tail has bounced you into a bit of trouble. Say, hey, who are you? I'm the narrator. Well, then, please, for goodness sakes, narrate me down from here. Very well. Now, hold on tight. Ooh, 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 ooh. You can let go now, Tigger. You're perfectly safe. Well, what did I tell you? Back we go. <laughs> oh, good old terra firma. Now you may have noticed that the narrator had been narrating all along, right? But the story turned when Tigger became conscious of the narrator. 
In the same way, everything in the book of Esther turns when Esther entertains an idea. Perhaps you were chosen to choose, because what would that mean? Well, the narrator had been narrating all along, but when Tigger bounced himself out of the book, he became aware that he was in a book. And when the narrator said, it seems that the spring in your tail has bounced you into a bit of trouble, Tigger becomes aware of the narrator. The narrator narrating himself. Even as he says, who are you? Even as he says, who are you? The miracle is happening. The narrator is narrating Tigger through Tigger as Tigger. Or should I say Tigger becomes aware that the narrator is narrating Tigger through Tigger uh, as uh, Tigger. For Tigger talks to the narrator saying, for goodness sake, he knows what good is, for goodness sake, narrate me down from here, which is then the rest of the story. And at that, the author literally turns the book upside down and the narrator says, you can let go now, Tigger. Now you can let go, Tigger. You're perfectly safe. And then Tigger lets go of his idea that climbing trees is what Tiggers do best. He was alone in that idea and he literally stands, he literally stands on the word and then slides down the text on the side of the page until once again he's grounded in the author's story. Now, we could believe, right, that that God the author might do that for one character in one moment of his story. Like the moment on the tree when Jesus cries out, Father, forgive them, and into your hands I commit, I surrender my spirit, and everything, everything bad turns into everything good for Jesus. We might believe that God might do that for one character in one moment, or, or maybe a few characters in a few moments, like my church, but not for all the characters in every moment. We can barely imagine it happened once, and yet, at some point, all of time is now. But we're often stuck in the past, worried about the future, and can't live now eternal life now. But what if it was true for all the characters in the story? So that for every character, every moment was somehow now. I mean, what if you are chosen to choose and everyone is chosen to choose all the time? I think that's eternity. That's the seventh day which as yet we can barely even begin to conceive, although it is eternity that conceives each one of us in time. Decision is the awakening to the eternal, writes Soren Kierkegaard. Our eternal self is born out of our temporal self in an eternal moment that will fill all of time, transforming the meaning of all things into gospel. Ephesians 1.10, this is the plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, the one who meets us at the tree. I mean, really, this is why we have so much trouble. We really cannot even imagine it. But maybe we can begin to imagine it with a great party like Purim. Or maybe a dance, a dance in which Jesus, the rhythm of the music, asks each one of us to dance. Remember like we talked about last week, the lonely nun, maybe the licentious old king like Solomon and Xerxes, all dancing for all one all to dance with Jesus. Or maybe everyone bouncing and everyone loving to bounce. As you know, Rabbit doesn't like Tigger's bouncing, which means he's bouncing himself out of the author's story, just like the Pharisees bounced themselves out of their own story, and they bounced Jesus onto a tree for him. But because of the crisis at the tree, Tigger is no longer interested in bouncing alone. He wants everyone to bounce and enjoy the bouncing. Oh, if I ever get out of this, I promise never to bounce again. Never! I heard that, Tigger! Rabbit was rather keen to agree to those oh, terms. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, 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 oh,
good old terra firma. I'm so happy. I feel like bouncing. Ah, uh, you promised. You promised. You mean I, I, I can't ever bounce again? Never. Never? And so it seems that what made Rabbit quite happy made Tigger quite the opposite. Oh, the poor dear. I like the old bouncy Tigger best. So do I, Roo. Of course, we all do. Don't you agree, Rabbit? I, I, uh... Well, Rabbit? I guess I like the old Tigger better, too. Oh, oh. oh, you mean I can have my bounce back? <laughs> oh, come on, Rabbit. Let's you and me bounce. Mama, uh, me bounce? You got the feet for it. Uh, I have? Sure. <laughs> it makes you feel just great. It does, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. Well, come on, everybody. And so they all did. Bounced and laughed and bounced some more. And I do think that on that day, Rabbit bounced highest of all. And so on the night, that the narrator was betrayed by all the characters in his story. He took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. Take it, eat it. And in the same manner, he took the cup, saying, this is the covenant, my dear, in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you. And, and now, just consider an idea. Perhaps every event in your life has led to this moment. I mean, the painful events and the happy events. The ones where you failed and the ones you think that you succeeded or were a success. Good fortune, bad fortune, I mean every roll of the dice. Think of that. Perhaps everything has led you to right now. This is the word of God. This is the narrator. narrator. He, he just said to you, take and eat. You see, he narrates all things from a throne in the sanctuary of your soul. And now he's asking you to join him. Amen. Amen. Sorry we went kind of long, um, but uh, everything I was saying was basically this, the benediction, believe the gospel. And what is the gospel in a word? Jesus. That's the word. And uh, what does Jesus mean? God is salvation. That's the story. And so who is Jesus? He's the narrator. <laughs> and he's inside of you. And so, this isn't about just one moment at camp when you got your ticket punched. <laughs> this is about every moment that's any moment. In Jesus' name, believe the gospel. Amen.